morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy week to join us. We're here, and I'm very honored to have a guest that's actually really hard to get. He doesn't do these sessions, so if you're here with us today, you're lucky because you're getting a piece of Hossam, who is a really busy character. And the reason I know this is unfair because, well, we've known each other since the start of Tabby, or before it was Tabby even, right, Hossam? So thank you for joining us all here today. And Thank I just you. want to say congratulations. $1.5 billion valuation, first fintech unicorn out of the UAE at Thank least. You. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable achievement. And just touching on that, because we're supposed to be doing a funding masterclass, I want to try and give exposure on that journey because venture capital, angel investing is something that's quite new to the region. It's not something that's been established for 30 years, 50 years, 60 years, Silicon Valley. So you're kind of leading the way for people to take an interest, understand, and perhaps template the approach to how do I raise money for a fintech in this ecosystem. So starting with this round, can you tell us the details about this round? How big was it? How was it structured? What can you tell us about the funding aspects of the round you just did? Yeah, so th uh, thanks for uh, having me, first of all. Um, so this round was our Series D um, I think if you, you've looked at the region, the funding history of this region, um, there's very few companies that get to that level of late stage funding. And I think it's a, it's a challenge that we've seen in this market historically. So maybe just uh, going, going back in time, um, uh, we were building Namshi in 2011. And at that point in time, venture capital as an industry was very, very young. Uh, and early stage investing was very difficult, right? So let alone, let alone late stage, early stage investing was a challenge just because of the lack of uh, options for founders to, uh, to secure funding from venture, capital, uh, venture capitalists in the region. So what we had to do in 2011 is go outside the region to seek early stage capital. Um, fast forward to where we are today, early stage capital seems to have been solved for. So, you know, seed, series A, and to a certain extent, Series B starts to be, is starting to become a, a, a lot more uh, in reach. However, growth stage and late stage is still very, very much a challenge. And for that, you're going to have to go externally, which is what we did, right? So I think we solved for early stage from within the region. Um, so most of our early stage uh, investors were uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Riyadh, uh, Dubai-based uh, investors, so the likes of Mubadala, um, uh, Mubadala and uh, Global Ventures, and uh, a couple of others from the region. And then as we started to get later into the business and, and towards larger ticket sizes, we had to go externally. So in this round, when you went for a much later stage in funding, probably the latest before you try and hit the next stage, which is IPO, anything else in your journey naturally occurring. Yep. How big was the investment group and pool from abroad? So um, this time around as well, we, we focused on looking for global investors that understood the space and were able to uh, write large tickets. The challenge was that we were in a time where late stage investing globally was challenged. So let alone the region, late stage st starting in 20, late 2021 started to become a lot more difficult. Uh, valuations were coming down, late stage investors were holding back their capital and waiting for opportunities uh, just driven by uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the growth of, or the oversaturation of uh, venture capital over 2020 and 2021. Um, so, you know, I think I think just looking back, what we focused on was building sustainability and profitability in the business to differentiate the story that we were coming with to the global investors. Right. So, growth was no longer um, what investors were seeking. They were seeking profitability. And so in 2021, when uh, the world changed, it was very, very important for us to start to uh, tell a different story, uh, show a different uh, narrative to the investors that we were speaking with. Um, and so you know, the, the focus became, let's look for investors that had deep pockets, that understood fintech, that had a certain comfort investing globally, 
because many of the, many of the late stage investors as well are a lot more comfortable investing in more mature, more developed markets like the US um, and showing them why this region was different and why the company was different. Region being different for us at Tabby, um, and one of the one of the key points that we wanted to get across to a lot of these investors was just the fact that buy now pay later globally was challenged, and there was a reason that was it was being challenged, uh, largely driven by the fact that it was a nice to have business model, as opposed to in a market like this one, where credit penetration was extremely low. Specifically, when we talk about credit penetration, we talk about Saudi, where credit penetration sits around 15 to 20 percent compared to global averages of 50 to 75% in, more, in some of the more mature markets. So we came to these investors saying, you know, this, this market is different. There is a real problem that we're solving for. And because this market is different, we've been able to build a sustainable business that has shown profitability in a relatively short period of time. Now, I've, I've been privileged to be an investor in Tabby as well as Klarna and some other companies we've talked about. And the modeling is different and how they all fundraise has been different. You've been a pioneer of sorts in this region because we've talked about how young this ecosystem still is. You had an exit from Namshi, you built that business. Was there a lot of advantages and learnings that you had in your early fundraising for Tabby? because you had exited from Namshi, or was it still such a young area that you had to do everything from scratch all over again? So on the fundraising front, I think just the fact that I was a second time founder, honestly just made it a lot easier to at least get access to investors. I think where many of the founders in the region struggle is early access to investors, which you know, once you're a second time founder, a third time founder, it becomes, that part becomes a lot easier. Right, but that on its own, I don't think is sufficient. Um, the, the fact that we had access uh, opened up the doors and made, made people you know, want to talk to us and be available for us, but uh, there needed to be a business model that was uh, attractive. Secondly, what we also found was uh, the level of competition in this market very quickly was quite high. So when we launched Tabby in 2020, uh, within six months, there were about five players in the space. Um, and so being a second time founder, I think some of the, some of the challenges that, we, uh, that you would typically face as a founder or, or some of the unknowns, I think we had a bit more clarity around. Uh, time to market was essential. Uh, the go to market strategy was very, very important. You know, things like ensuring that we had access to a number of anchor merchants in the early days, ensuring that we had enough access to capital at the expense of dilution. Right? So one of the things that we did where a lot of founders, I think today, or just uh, inexperienced founders, I would say, struggle with is they focus a bit too much on optimizing for dilution and uh, you know, working to ensure that they get the right valuation at a very early stage, not take too much capital in because they're overly sensitive around dilution. I think one of the learnings that we saw at, at Namshi is you want to optimize for survival rather than optimize for dilution, i.e. have enough capital, it's fine, you're going to get diluted, you're going to have less equity at an earlier stage of the or less of a stake of the business at an earlier stage than you would like, but you ensure that you're still around when the going gets tough. Thanks for that. I think apart from just being a pioneer in the space, you know, building a unicorn, building out a business. You've also been a pioneer in fintech structures, inadvertently perhaps to some degree. And it's something that I think that a lot of founders and companies and VCs are now taking for granted as, as a template. And what I'm referring to is equity financing and debt financing. Uh, up until Tabby, and my knowledge in the region, there weren't many venture capital backed companies that had disassociated from their balance sheet to debt financing. And we see it all over the place now. So in essence, you had created that. What, what caused you, what was the turning point where equity dilution with fundraising and balance sheet, was it something that you decided very early on, very quickly, or was it something that matured from a, a learning from global businesses and how they had raised in this space, especially you know, when it comes to BNPL? Yeah, I think for BNPL, it was fairly clear that this is, you know, this is a balance sheet business and therefore we needed to secure a balance sheet. Uh, and balance sheet is essentially what 
um, either makes or breaks this business, right? The fact that we were able to grow at an early stage through equity funding, um, at some point you hit a wall. Um, you know, prime example is, uh, is what we did was we went out and secured relationships with some of the largest merchants in the market. Um, and before we knew it, we were starting to hit a wall um, in terms of our ability to grow our business with these uh, merchants. Uh, the way the business model works is we lend or we provide capital to a merchant and then we get paid by the customer. And so there's only so far that you can go with equity financing on its own. A business like ours, balance sheet was essential and therefore I think it was, it was a given that we would go and, and try to secure debt. Having said that, very few debt investors are willing to provide access to debt prior to seeing some sort of traction in terms of the growth of business, but also traction in terms of the ability to raise equity. They need to ensure that you have a sufficient equity cushion with which uh, they're able to lend. So um, you know, where, where we were is we, we had to go out and lend through equity initially, which obviously for us as a business is extremely expensive because you're diluting every time you grow. Uh, but working in parallel to secure debt at an early stage. And again, this is debt at an early stage that is likely more expensive and much more unaffordable than you would like. But um, the way we justified it for us internally is we needed to unlock that first debt check before we were able to get more and more debt investors to come in. So our first debt check was $20 million. We actually uh, just closed and, and we'll announce it uh, very shortly. So this is uh, this is for a closed but not very closed group. Uh, we've uh, we just secured a seven hundred million dollar facility as well to allow us to really continue to fund this uh, uh, this business going forward. Oh wow! Congratulations, seven hundred million. Is that the largest startup founding debt financing in the region? That should be yes. Oh wow! Congratulations on that. That's, Thank you. That's a great milestone yet again. I think as a person that's been trying to set the templates, benchmarks, dynamically evolving from the business models that you have to keep reaching and continually getting funding from regional and international sources, what I wanted to touch upon was data. And I think for outside investors or regional investors to back founders like yourselves who are trying to build disruptive businesses, whether it's fintech, whether it's AI, there's a lack of data in the region, or has that changed now that allows people to understand the actual unit economics of growth? So for example, where you were talking about card penetration, you're talking about transparency of having that knowledge. So you can demonstrate the opportunity or the size of the market. Has that changed since you first started, or is it still opaque to some degree? It's still not great, uh, to be honest. I, th I don't think we have that level of data that we need to a, understand uh, the market to the depth that we need to, and but also B, tell a story to, uh, to global investors, right? I mean, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we needed to overcome as we were telling our story and trying to sell to global investors is the size of the opportunity, right? Time and time again, we had investors coming back and saying, yeah, listen, it's, it's great that you guys have grown, uh, but how much bigger is this market? Uh, how much bigger can you get? Um, for us, one, one example I can share is uh, PayPal Ventures looked at us at the Series A and they were impressed with the numbers but said, you know, great, how, how much bigger can this get? And then they looked at and they passed at the Series A. They looked at us again at B and same story. And then at the C, I think they realized, you know, there, there was something really there. Uh, but it's unfortunate that we need to keep telling that story that there is a sizable market over here and there is a sizable opportunity that we, we um, are going after uh, across multiple sectors. I don't think this is uh, specific to us in buy now, pay later or fintech, uh, but there is a real deep market that founders can go after. Um, and I think, I think there is a uh, lack of data that tells that story or, or that allows them to tell that story. I think it's very clear that the fintech space is facing a bit more of a resurgence and you've been helping with that by creating a beacon for people to have confidence in entrepreneurs that come from this region that can build international businesses. So with that, I'd like to close by saying thank you, Hassam, for being a pioneer, for taking time out, for sharing your insights and stories with us today. We wish you all the best going forward. Best of luck. 
best of health, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you all for your time.